Hello, my name is Brooks Elms, and I am here with my friend Pamela J. Smith. And we are here to have a conversation about a topic that's dear to both of us, uh, the craft, screenwriting, storytelling, and impacting our audiences and the world. Uh, how are you doing, Pamela? Oh, very well, thank you. I appreciate being invited to join you. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I've been I've been looking forward to this conversation because I really like the uh, the way you talk about the craft. From I've seen in your, like your film courage interviews, and it's just uh, it's really really exciting. So I, I thought, oh, we'll have a wonderful conversation. <laughs> I'm sure uh, we will. Yeah. Great. Well, let, let, let's start. Off. Tell me, tell me about how you, how you started off in the business. Where did this uh, this passion come from for you? Oh well, I was at University of Texas at Austin, and at the time I was an English major, Latin minor, and um, was doing a bit of modeling, and was asked to work on a film, and it was pretty obvious pretty quickly that I should be behind the camera, not in front of the camera, because <laughs> I just could not act at all. <laughs> so a friend said, why don't you go to film school? And so I went to the University of Texas Film School, and it got me started in the business. And right after graduation, we formed a production company and a casting and talent agency. Wow. And uh, we're writing, and uh, film productions would come to Texas. And I got to work on one, Gordon Parks' film, Lead Belly. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, Roger E. Mosley. So it, I got to be the location casting director. It was great fun. Met lots of people who said, y'all need to come out to Hollywood. So we did about, um, we called it the Great Migration of 76. And 17 of us who'd gone to film school together moved out to Hollywood. Wow. 17. Yeah. That's yeah. a lot. And a number of us are still here and still active in the business. So it was wonderful to have that long-term friends support team going into you know hollywood so mm -hmm. it, uh, it's really nice that we bunch we still see each other so that's how i got into wow that's wonderful that is a mass migration 17 that's amazing yeah i went to nyu film school and when i first got to la almost all my new york friends were here cool. so it was uh yeah it makes a difference it makes a difference definitely does yeah it really does it really does well you went to a very good film school too yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I liked it. I mean, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was like the, the biggest thing for me for film school, and um, was because I'd made a lot of movies with my friends in high school for the fun of it, and then I got oh. to NYU, and um, and everybody there is, I'm sure, it was the same thing. At UT is the just total film geeks, so the film oh. literacy there was tremendous, and every conversation was about, oh, and this film and that film. If you like this director, you got to see. You know, he did this and this and this and this. And so I was like, oh, I was, you know, like a babe in the woods in terms of, oh, my goodness. I because I because at that point, I'd only seen like the popular movie of the week uh, in the, you know, when I when I was growing up in high school, I was making a lot of movies, but I was just seeing whatever was popular. So um, so for me, the film literacy part of, of hanging out with film people was was really tremendous. I think that's so valuable. And. I'm glad to see some of the film schools doing more of that again. Some still don't, apparently. Hmm. But I think it's it's so important. It's just like um, learning music. You know, some people are just naturally brilliant at music. Mm -hmm. But most people need to learn music theory, music history, uh, learn technique, learn the craft, so that then you can really infuse your art into those tools that have proven to work over thousands and thousands of years and same with story yeah yeah that's right it, it's uh it, it, it to me it was it's it's like been this progression of loving the craft right from the jump but then really understanding how to sort of express that in a in a, in a broader broader perspective so so certainly with sort of the way Hollywood does its storytelling, but then, and we'll get into this later, but the way myth, mythological storytelling works too, because it's the same thing, but it's just, it's, it's slightly different symbols. Um, and and when you find an, an authentic way to use those different symbols, it branches out and speaks to, you know, more people. So that was that was sort of my, my journey. And one of the reasons I was most excited to talk to you is, is um, is that you know you, to to hear more about your thinking on mythology and religion? But we'll get to that in a second. What um, 
tell us tell us about one of your favorite projects in your life that you've worked on, either one of the books you read or a, or a movie you've worked on or somebody you've worked on. What was when you think back, what's, what pops to your mind is like one of the favorite things you've ever worked on. You know, I guess that would be, and I've done a lot of uh, documentaries and uh, corporate comedies and commercials and all, but as far as Hollywood. I was four years in production at Universal Studios, mm -hmm. and I worked for Joel Schumacher, the director who mm -hmm. unfortunately passed away not too long ago. And I got to be his secretary on The Incredible Shrinking Woman. Wow. And so got to meet Lily Tomlin and mm -hmm. work with her, and it was a big special effects show. We were on stage 12, which is the largest stage at Universal. Mm -hmm. Massive. And the special effects crew, uh, props-wise, built you know, like giant rocking chairs and giant furniture, so that when Lily had shrunk, then you know you'd get that juxtaposition. <laughs> and then we had a wonderful cinematographer, Bruce Logan, and uh, he, I think his first film was uh, 2001 with Kubrick, so he had a nice <laughs> background already. And um, well, they were doing a lot of um, rear screen projection and um, overlays and all these special effects. And it was so fascinating to watch all of that technically. And then also with the, the building of the massive props. And it was a long project, but it was so much fun. And I'm still close friends with a number of the people that I worked with on that. So I'd say... That would be a Hollywood highlight. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, there really is such a special thing about even like when I was, you know, in school doing a play with a group of people. There's something that, that the team aspect of we're going to get together as a group and tell this story is so powerful. Um, and then when you add like the rocket fuel of it being like a big, you know, you know, like a story that the whole world is going to see and hear of, it gets uh -huh. even even more exciting. So wow, what a what a wonderful story. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate having had that experience. It was really yeah. great. Learned learned an awful lot. I bet. I bet. Wow, that's that's really exciting. So tell me how you um uh from there you got into thinking about the craft and sort of teaching the craft. What was what was from from the projects in the business to sort of writing some books and, and talking about craft? What, well, how how did that transition go for you? Oh, okay. Well, how I started getting into, I'd always been interested in mythology from the fourth grade mm. and, you know, studying the classics, of course, in school, you get exposed to a lot of those wonderful old stories. So it was always an interest of mine. But uh, after Universal, I went freelance and was uh, producing, you know, commercials, you know, McDonald's and whatever. And, all yeah. that. and then started working for a uh, corporate films also so doing both of those and mainly aerospace boeing and such mm -hmm. so uh, i was also taking classes though on uh, metaphysics and the mm -hmm. physics of metaphysics and comparative mysticism at the philosophical research society here in los angeles wow. and um gosh about five or six of us who are in the film industry we're taking these classes and kind of met, some of us knew each other beforehand, some of us met each other there, and then went on to work together over the decades. We had an assignment from the teacher, and she said, I want you to put into your profession what you're learning here, and tell us all what's your plan. And at the time, we'd been learning about the chakras. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I'm doing aerospace stuff. I'm doing commercials. How can I work this into that? And then it hit me. Oh, it's about characters because the chakras define different motivations and mm. different um, approaches to the world and interpretations of the world and that they're physiological. I, I, when I'm giving the, the chakras, talking, usually I bring a cadaver with me and I'll lay it down face down and I'll slice <laughs> down the spinal column and I'll show you where these chakras are. And they're bundles wow. of nerves, right? Yeah. So, and they're connected to the endocrine glands that then, you know, put out um, cortisone or adrenaline or the sex hormones and all the way, you know, on up. 
And it was so fascinating. And when you start looking at mythological characters with you know, imposing chakras on it and a lot hmm. of the symbols and symbology, if you will, yeah, it's there. It's there. And wow. I thought, well, you know, I could just teach people how to do this to help them build more unique and believable characters. So that's how it all got started. It was an assignment in a metaphysics class. <laughs> Wonderful. What? What? I mean, that's that's great. I, I love when you you know we're able to meet somebody, just ask the right question or the right challenge or prompt, and it just leads to what a, an amazing opening for you in your life to just go walking through. And that's that's tremendous. Yeah. Thank you. Was, yeah, it was quite fortuitous. So let me see this. How do you see um, the relationship between like myth and religion? How would you sort of define those terms? In okay, um, first I'll define myth, as many people do, as uh, the stories we tell ourselves to explain the world around us and within us, mm -hmm. and to explain the worlds that we have created. So a lot mm -hmm. of myths are propaganda, right, or justification, yeah. and <clears throat> then to differentiate from mythology and spiritualism and religion myths are it's said that if a, if a myth is a powerful myth it's usually true on seven levels seven like yeah it, 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 yes such as mm -hmm. physiologically uh physically psychologically okay. sociologically sure. historically etc up to the cosmos yeah. okay nice and the myths are universal, whereas legends are kind of based on history and can become myths. And folklore usually is to instill the local cultures, paradigms into its people. So sometimes they're local. So if you think of that kind of a nested thing. So spirituality tends to be, from what I have learned, and certainly a lot of that is from Joseph Campbell's works. Mm -hmm. as well as you know other religious studies but where the difference comes in is you can see it in the actual meaning of religion its root word is religari which means to bind oh nice to, yes to put into a form so where spiritualism and spirituality is global is universal maybe the whole cosmos we don't know yet but yeah. religion is the binding of those ideas, typically for social control Ooh. and indoctrination. Nice. Well, to keep a people, offer them comfort, and also keep them doing what you want them to do. So. Wow. Wow, I love that. Those are really uh, powerful ways to think about it. And I love right. the differentiation between, you know, like a folktale, or a myth, those, those, defining those differences is really fascinating. Um, I love them. That's great. <laughs> how? Let me see this. How? Because um, I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan, and and I and you know he talked about sort of the, the monomyth, and you know and, you know referring to sort of the hero's. My understanding is he was referring to basically the hero's journey. Um, but I think in your view, there's there's more mythic story patterns than just that one. Um, is that true? And and how many other ones? have you sort of seen or identified that are different than just like that hero's journey pattern? Okay, yes. In fact, uh, Dr. Campbell himself, a couple of years after Hero with a Thousand Faces said, you know, it's, there's not just a monomyth, there's a bunch of other mythic themes too. So, you know, he came, I just studied a bit more and went, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch more. So I have identified about 20 and wow. yeah because they don't all follow now the hero's journey absolutely it's fabulous chris vogler's book has mm -hmm. been wonderful to help popularize all that yeah and it really works but a lot of people that would come to me for consultations would say i can't make my story fit into the hero's journey paradigm and yeah. i take a look at it that's because it's not on that theme it's a different theme and it could be for instance, lost love rescued, as exemplified by the Orpheus and Eurydice myth. 
Mm. Or it could be the search for the promised land. Okay. Mm. Moses myth and you know many others about the search for the promised land. It could be about twins, mm -hmm. uh, either internally or externally. Gilgamesh and Enkidu out of the you know Meso uh, Mesopotamian mythic system, wow. or it could be the wake up call <laughs> and you've got uh, well Moses again, and you've got uh, King Arthur and you've got Luke Skywalker, where all of a sudden. You realize, oh, I'm not just little old me. I've got a bigger destiny. There's something else out there. And the search for the soulmate and the great escape. Chicken Run's a wonderful example of the great escape. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. So uh, there are many, many different mythic themes. And that's great news for all of us who are writers and filmmakers because these themes are once again universal mm -hmm. so when you tap into them and, and what i've seen is that you can identify about 12 plot points for each theme sometimes more depending on how in-depth you want to go mm -hmm. but if you as a writer as a creator hit at least a half a dozen of those 12 it's like hitting certain notes in a certain key yeah, you don't have to hit everyone, and it doesn't have to be in order of how they happen in the particular myth that you're looking at. So it's a wonderful way to use. Once again, going back to music, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. playing in you know key of B flat or the key of F major, and you just have to hit those certain notes, and it resonates. Yeah, and we yeah. get it. Wow, that's and great. Um, and I love that. That's that's really interesting. Have you have you looked at Blake Snyder's Save the Cat system at all? And do you? I'm curious about your thoughts about that and how that makes sense. If if you see any sort of value in that and how that kind of, uh, I, I mean, how familiar are you with his system? Oh, I think it's a very good system. I, I see that it has helped a lot of people mm -hmm. make their way through, particularly people who are just starting out, which is fabulous to have that. So they get a a more grounded uh, familiarity with the techniques of screenwriting. Mm -hmm. And I think he did a wonderful job. And he was a, just a lovely person. Did you, did you meet Blake? Did you? Know? Yes. Yes. Really, <laughs> a really nice guy. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I think it's real helpful. Yeah. I, I met him a few times too. I, I really, really enjoyed him. Uh, total wow. sweetheart. And um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So are you, um, so when you like to consult with people, are you still actively consulting these days or? Absolutely. I've got about four clients going right now and nice. some more knocking on the door. And I'm very thankful for that these days. Boy, howdy. Yeah, yeah wonderful. That's good. And what's your uh, favorite time in the process to get involved with a client when they're coming up with a new idea or they've got some of the stuff worked out or what's your, like if you could snap your fingers, what, what's your ideal time to, to, to get in there and support them? Ah, okay. Uh, that's a, a provocative question. Um, having worked on things from where it's their fifth draft to somebody just says, oh, I, got an, I got an idea. One of the services that I do offer is called brainstorming. Mm. And we could just get on the phone or you know meet somewhere and talk and say, I think I want to tell a story about so-and-so, but I'm not sure how I want to do it. And you can ask a number of questions and begin to identify what is the soul of their goal in telling that story. And then I can supply them with a couple of mythic themes that could help do that. And then also archetypes and symbols. So the, to me, actually, yes, the ideal would be starting from the, uh, not somebody saying, oh, I want to story, write a story, but I don't know what. No, no, when you think you kind of know what, <laughs> right. And I'd like to come in and help you. I love that. So what what I what I picture is um you have like this buffet of mythical options and you can go, oh, you can kind of go this this way and you can go to this They're almost grooves of of sort of patterns. And you can say, well, look, if your your core sort of elements that are calling you, um, then you could kind of go through this groove and then you hit these sort of beats and then you tend to elicit these sorts of thoughts and feelings. Is that sound more or less the, the way you work? Absolutely it is. 
absolutely. And the wonderful thing about myths again, too, is that on any particular mythic theme, you can give it a a sense, a tonality, Mm. where it could be a dark drama. You can take that same theme and maybe choose different ones of the plot points. And with your tonality, it can become a comedy. Yeah. Get, you know, so the, the themes are very, very facile as patterns. And then yeah. you add through uh, symbols and just the tonality of the words that you choose, you make it your own. So you're using something timeless and universal, but you will tell that story differently than I would than person A or person B. Right. So it's interesting. So the way that you're referring to you know, your sort of system of doing it, you, you keep saying like, you know, this, this mythic theme and these different ones, I would use the word almost like, you know, format or pattern. Do you have a, a def, and, and when I think of theme, I tend to think of like an idea or the lesson learned, right? And, but I think you're kind of combining lesson learned with format, right? Like how do you do, if somebody asks you, that's, a, that's sort of what, what's your definition of theme? How do you answer that question? Okay. Uh, and there's lots of different opinions about this too, you know, yeah. the theme and the premise. But for me, the theme is an inherent storyline that indeed brings a certain revelation. Yeah. There's, and what I, I find really, really helpful to use along with a theme are the mythic statements and that subtext is great. It's wonderful. But sometimes you need to say right up front what you're doing. Yeah. And so I suggest three mythic statements. And one of them is the mythic theme where you just have one of the characters say, hey, this is what this is about. Yeah. And then you've got the lesson statement. So that's the mythic state, the thematic statement. And then the lesson statement. No, I'm sorry. Then the mission statement. Uh-huh. You know, okay, you got to go rescue the princess. You got to go save the galaxy. Yeah. And then the lesson statement, oh, I learned more about me than I did about saving the galaxy. But I also saved the galaxy while I was at it. <laughs> right. So by, by having your thematic statement, your mission statement, and your lesson statement, you can really nail down your theme. And they should all relate to each other and be of a of a unit, if you will, different aspects of that unit. Wow, very cool. Um, yeah, and they don't have to come in order either. And my favorite example of that, just real quickly, is if you watch uh, Apocalypse Now, mm -hmm. the very first thing you get is the lesson statement. And then you, when uh, Captain Willard says, you know, it's, uh, Everyone gets everything they ask for. I asked for a mission and for my sins, they gave me one. Oh. And he talks about his alignment with Colonel Kurtz. Yeah. And then it seems later he gets his mission to go up river and terminate the Colonel with extreme prejudice. And then there's a wonderful thematic statement right after that in that same scene with uh, the general saying there's a conflict in every human heart. And, you know, goes on to say some fabulous words. So just check out the first 10 minutes of Apocalypse Now and see how magnificently powerful those three statements can be. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good example of, um, of, of taking something that, you know, plays out really pretty grounded and, you know, a Vietnam story, but goes right into those um, you know, uh, mythic grooves. Um, oh. Yeah. So it's it's doing both, and I think it's partly the the power of it. Um, wow, I love that example. Really, really great. So um, we're we're gonna wind it down here. It's, it's a short and sweet conversation. But one last question: What's the um? Because you've written several books, right? So what's your favorite book that you've written? Oh, that's like which? Okay, you, you remind me of Southwest Airlines once. They were saying, okay, if we lose pressure and the oxygen masks fall down, put yours on first and then decide which is your favorite child. <laughs> right. It's like, what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I'm not asking you to, to uh, dis, you know, dismiss any of them. What's, 
one that comes to your mind that you'd enjoy talking about, knowing that they were, all of them are lovely and worthy of attention? Um, what's one right now in this moment, perhaps related to this conversation, that that um, that comes to your mind? Uh, first of all, I'll say thanks so much to Michael Weesey Productions, my publisher, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I've done more books with them. And it's been a, a wonderful process working with them, and they have a great collection of film books. They're, they're the best. I mean, what what a what a what a massive impact they've made in our industry. That 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 company just tremendous. And, and lovely people too. Really good people. Nice. A book that I did on my own was uh, with my one of my writing partners, and it's called "Show Me the Love: All mm -hmm. Kinds of Love for All Kinds of Stories." Ooh, so. Nice. Love of country, love of death and destruction, warrior love, family love, love for animals, alien love, chivalric love, and show the mythic background for each of those, and then lots of examples, and then cinematic techniques and uh, writing style suggestions for it. That was so interesting to research and put together and we plan on doing yet another edition sometimes hopefully soon but i say right now that's my favorite one because it allowed us to look into so many different directions and find so many interesting examples like mm -hmm. and even right now you see playing out in europe love of death and destruction Oh. and love of country and wow. they're in conflict big time right now mm -hmm. wow that's great i love it I, I love how you are applying these ideas that can often be sort of esoteric or you know myth is often used as something that's not true <laughs> um, uh -huh. oh it's a myth it's not actually true but um but no when, when as i've sort of really sort of become slowly a better and better screenwriter over year over the years and deepen my understanding of craft when i'm really at my best it's it all resonates to the truth so it takes an abstract idea but i can make it real like you did you, did, you took this idea but you're saying look this is playing in the front uh in the headlines you know of today's news right so wow. to me that's that's a, it's a really wonderful way when we can see the all line up and then we understand the idea and we understand how it's happening in the real world and we and we understand how to put it in our screenplay so that it can unfold in a way so we serve our audience so it makes a, an authentic impact on them in, in, when they when they take, take in our story. Absolutely, and I think that is our goal as storytellers is to reach people's hearts and minds, if you will, and um, sometimes think of it like a, a triangle where at the top is the myth or the theme, the thing that you want to make. And then one leg comes down to you, the interpreter, if you will, the yeah. creator of a version of that concept. And then you put it out to the audience, to the reader, to the film uh, buff, uh, or somebody sitting, you know, binge watching your show. Right. But for them, it doesn't come back to you. So you take them then back up to that top point of that theme and concept. So that triangle, you've done your job as a storyteller. Yeah, it's wonderful. Wow, what a wonder! I love that image, and I know, uh, and I love that description of that really magical experience especially when we dial it in really beautifully so what a what a wonderful way to, to conclude the conversation oh, yeah. I, I love that <laughs> so thank you so much for for coming in and having this talk and i know um uh, the people in my community for sure will, will will get will get a lot out of this conversation and um and I, I really appreciate it